Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Canadian Pacific stock by analyzing their financial ratios and dissecting their financial statements so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Canadian Pacific is a Canadian railway incorporated in 1881. The railway is owned by Canadian Pacific Railway Limited which began operations as its legal entity in a corporate restructuring in 2001. The company's railway tracks span 20,000 kilometers or 12,500 miles. That's across six Canadian provinces and also into the United States. It stretches from Montreal to Vancouver and as far north as Edmonton. Its rail network also serves Minneapolis, St. Paul, Milwaukee, Detroit, Chicago, and Albany, New York. The company became one of the largest and most powerful companies in Canada, a position it held as late as 1975. Let's get started with the model. We're looking at the ticker that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange, so everything in this video is in Canadian dollars. This is a large cap company, 59 billion market cap, they're trading at 439 a share and they have 136 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you forecast the future free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has positive and healthy free cash flow every year. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they also have positive net income each year. Revenue looks pretty good. It grows a lot from 2017 to 2019, but their revenue hasn't grown much in a trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is a revenue, the sales. Below that is cost of revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. So they have their highest gross profit of 4.4 billion, which is a little higher than 2019 of 4.3 billion. They have about 1 billion of operating expenses every year. So their operating income was the highest in the trailing 12 months at 3.4 billion. The company does have a lot of debt. So they have about a half a billion dollars of interest payments on their debt. Then they have other income and expenses and of course taxes and they have pretty good net income each year, two to two and a half billion dollars a year. This is the statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much money the company generates from its operational business. Then capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant and equipment. And when you take operating cash flow minus capex, you get your free cash flow. And that was one billion in trailing 12 months, which was less than 2019. The company has been purchasing a lot of capital stock the last four years, 381 million, 1.1 billion, 1.1 billion, and again 1.1 billion. So the two ways to reward investors are to pay dividends or to buy back stock. This company does both. And they're paying back more debt the past four years than they've been issuing, so that's a good sign. When you invest in a company, you want to make sure they have positive and strong operating cash flow. Because if a business doesn't have positive operating cash flow, it can't sustain a business for a long time. This company has positive and healthy operating cash flow each year. To calculate operating cash flow, it's net income, which is $2.3 billion. Then you have to add back the non-cash items from the income statement, depreciation of $760 million. They had deferred taxes of $198 million. And you also have to adjust for changes in working capital. That was negative $252 million. So they had $2.9 billion of operating cash flow. That's a little less than last year of $3 billion. Let's look at a capital structure. $9.1 billion of debt and $9 billion of net debt. The interest rate they pay in their debt is 5%. The cost of debt is 3.8%. And they have 56% debt, which means they have 44% equity. Cost of equity is 8.1%. To calculate cost of equity, we need the beta. That's how volatile the stock is. And they have a pretty low beta, 0.75. So the stock moves less than the market. And their WAC is 5.66%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $48 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $43 billion. We divide that by 136 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 320. They're trading at 439, so they're trading at a 37% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is a little higher than me. They're at 341, so they're also saying the stock is overvalued. 
So you can see the stock has only gone up the past five years. So no matter where you bought it, you would have made a nice return. The company has been raising their dividend a lot the past five years from 35 cents up to 95 cents. And they pay a 0.87% dividend yield and they have a 20% payout ratio. That means the other 80% is used to buy back stock, pay down debt, or grow the business. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $59,000 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $55,000 today. The stock is doing much better than S&P, up 30% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 15%. The 52-week low is 252, the 52-week high is 444. And the stock is trading above its 50-day moving average and 200-day moving average, so it's on an uptrend. And when the 50-day moving average moves above the 200-day moving average, that's called the Golden Cross. That's a bullish signal. And of the 135 million shares outstanding, 123 million are on float. They're available to investors to buy. 79% of the shares are held by institutions, so they're bullish on this stock. And it has a really low short percentage, 0.66%. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 12.2, the median is 14.8, P.E. is stock price over earnings per share, they're 25.8, so they're doing a bit worse than the median average. 25.8 indicates that investors are willing to pay $26 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share, they're at 7.7, so they're doing a little worse than the average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 8.4, so they're doing much worse than a median and average. The way you calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have $7.1 billion of equity. But they have $6.9 billion of tangible equity, so they have a little bit of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense, so they can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They're at 33%, so they have a great ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities, so they can only cover half of their current liabilities. And their current assets are $133 million of cash, $805 million of receivables, and $182 million of inventory. So the company is not well capitalized. They're probably going to need to issue more stock or sell more debt to run the business over the next 12 months. Because their free cash flow was $1 billion, but their working capital is currently negative $1 billion. And the best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Canadian Railway and National Express Group, both in the same industry as Canadian Pacific. And if CP has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. They have the worst PE of all three companies, also the worst price of sales and price to book of all three companies. They have the worst current ratio at 0.5. All the companies are below 1 in this category. They have the best ROE of all the companies, so they're bringing in a lot of income relative to their equity. They have the same amount of debt as National Express. And in terms of market cap, they're a pretty big company, $59 billion, but they're smaller than the Canadian Railway, much bigger than National Express. All these numbers are in Canadian dollars. They do pay a dividend, but Canadian National pays a much better dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 37% premium because what this company does is too important for the Canadian government and Canadian consumers. And they're going to always be around and their stock price will probably always increase in the long term. And their financials look really good, although their ratios look a bit weak. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.